Welcome to Genetic Counseling Awareness Channel with Katie Lee. All the best resources you'll ever need at Genetic Counseling Awareness Channel. Hi guys, it's me, Katie Lee, CGC, and welcome back to my channel for another episode of Wannabe Wednesday. On Wannabe Wednesday, I talk about topics of interest for those of you who are interested in learning more about genetic counseling as a profession, and for those of you who are currently waiting for interviews or gearing up for interviews for genetic counseling graduate school. Today, I'm going to take a viewer request, and I will be talking about the ethical questions that you may get asked during genetic counseling graduate school interviews. How often do those ethical questions come up anyways? I feel like I got one ethical question at each of the schools I interviewed with. Not one from each of the interviewers, just one total. So I do expect that you will get a few ethical questions, but you're probably not going to be bombarded with them. I think there's a few things you need to know just right off the bat, which is one, you are not expected to know like theory of medical ethics. No, that is not a prerequisite to become a genetic counselor. And in fact, when you do come across challenging ethical situations in your career as a genetic counselor, you will not be making the decision alone in most of those cases. You'll have a team um, as well as colleagues that you can bounce ideas off of in those types of situations. So, you know, you don't need to be an expert on medical ethics, but but what you do need to be aware of is that your answer demonstrates your character and your values and the values that are um, important to being a genetic counselor and that your answer demonstrates competency, that you understand the question and the complexities of the question or ethical dilemma at hand. So I want to go through a few different situations. Some are situations I've read about, others are situations I've been in give you some fresh examples because when I looked online, I really couldn't find many examples of, of ethical questions that come up in these interviews. And I think these are three great examples of the types of questions you can get. And then also I want to walk through what a good answer might look like. Okay, so let's get at it. Ethical question number one, this is going to be a pediatric ethical question. Let's say that you have a patient, she's a two-year-old and she prevents with a severe epilepsy disorder. She completes genetic testing and she is found to have an autosomal recessive condition. She has two genetic changes, one on each copy of that specific gene of interest. Her parents complete genetic testing as well. A little bit of information about her parents. They are young. They're in their early 20s. They're unmarried. Your patient, the two-year-old, let's call her Molly, is their only child. Um, the mom is the caretaker of Molly, and the dad works. As follow-up to Molly's results, the parents complete parental testing, and the mother is found to be a carrier of one of the mutations that Molly has, but the father does not carry the second mutation that Molly has. What do you think about that? What does that mean to you? So sometimes ethical questions will be multi-parts. They will be quizzing you on your knowledge and they will also be quizzing you on your ethical stances and what you would do in that type of situation. So what that should mean to you is that, ooh, Molly's father may not be her biologic father. And that is called misattributed paternity. When going into this appointment and going into the genetic testing, you assume that Molly's father who's presenting there is indeed her biologic father, and you find out on testing that he may not be. So there's a few different explanations beyond that. One explanation could be that the second mutation in Molly arose de novo. It was sporadic, and that can happen. doesn't happen most of the time. Most of the time, our mutations are inherited from our parents. Another possibility is gonadal mosaicism, that Molly's father's blood did not have the mutation in it. But in his gonads and his sperm cells, there, there that mutation lies. And that means that he potentially could pass it on to additional children in the future. That is fairly rare as well. Um, the most likely possibility is probably that Molly's father who presented in the appointment is not her biologic father. So those are three possible reasons why that could happen. Now that we covered that question, that kind of addresses competency and your knowledge of genetics, which you may or may not know, and that is completely fine. That is something you would learn in graduate school. Let's get onto the ethical piece, which is, let's say you interviewee, you are reviewing the results and you see that uh, Molly's father was not found to have the mutation and the couple is going to be in in 30 minutes with Molly for their results session to go over the results. How will you counsel Molly's family? 
How would you? This is a good question, right? So I think one thing you can say is that ideally, the couple should have received pre-test counseling. And when their blood was drawn or before it was drawn and before they consented to the testing on themselves, they should have been informed that it is possible that this type of parental testing can sometimes uncover misattributed paternity. Pre-test counseling is always ideal. You always rather give that warning prior to that patient coming in for results and have something that's not anticipated. I do this a lot with pre-test counseling for different tests that my laboratory I used to work for offered because some of them had a, a decently high inconclusive rate. And I'd much rather a patient know upfront that an inconclusive is a possibility rather than they come to me after the fact and say, you never told me this could happen. Now I have to go through this whole procedure again to get another sample. And you know that's disappointing. Rightfully so. So pre-test counseling, counseling. Now, what would you do? I think what I would do if both of the parents came into the appointment is I would sit them down and explain that the results were not what I expected. I see that uh, Molly's mother has one of the mutations Molly has, but Molly's father and the appointment does not. And there are multiple reasons for why this can happen. And I would go through those three reasons. I would not single in on non-paternity unless the patient or their partner asked me to. Ask me to explain it more. Ask me to uh, maybe ask what are the chances that it could be gonadal mosaicism versus sporadic mutation versus misattributed paternity. I would try and keep it very simple. And I think it's important to bring it up because we want the patient to understand what the recurrence risk is for this condition. So we want the patient to know that um, if the, Molly's parents, the, the father and mother at the appointment get together again to have a child, their chance to have an affected child is probably very, very low since Molly's presumed father is not a carrier of the condition. And hopefully, um, you can kind of hope that Molly's mother is getting clued into the fact that the biologic father may very well is likely a carrier of the condition. Now, I wouldn't spell out misattributed paternity. I would be weighing the uh, pros and cons of spelling that out because I don't want to do harm to this family system, who's probably already going through quite a bit as a young couple and a couple of a child with a severe epilepsy disorder. Now, would it be appropriate to just say, I'm not going to tell the parents unless they ask, I'm not going to tell them what their results are. I'm just going to focus on the fact that Molly herself had two mutations. She indeed is confirmed to be affected with this epilepsy disorder. I don't think so. The reason I don't think so is because it doesn't tell them about recurrence risk. They may go out of this appointment assuming they have a 100% chance to have another child with this condition. They may assume a 25% chance to have another child with this condition. They don't know either of their statuses. So they don't know if they are with different partners, what their risk is. So to me, that would not be doing my job as a genetic counselor. Another point you could bring up is that genetic counseling, oftentimes, especially in a pediatric setting, is genetic counseling for not just one patient, but for the whole family, because it is so common to do these parental studies. So you need to think of each of the people you order testing on and each of the people presenting in your office as your patient in a way, and making sure that you give each of them the information they need to be informed about their genetic results. I'm going to try and keep my next two a lot quicker here. I think that was a good, like long in-depth example. Let's say you have a couple who presents to you, an older couple, like in their 60s, who presents to you for a genetic counseling appointment. You work at an IVF clinic and there's no information. They're there for their first day appointment. They just met with the doctor and nothing's really in their records yet. The female patient informs you that her daughter passed away at the age of 25 from cancer and her daughter's one wish was to have children and she never got to fulfill that wish. Before she passed, the daughter froze her eggs in case she made it through the cancer um, so that she would have an option for fertility in the future. And as her cancer progressed, she expressed to her mom that she would want her mom to use those eggs to create, to create babies and to raise those babies if her mother and father wished. So the daughter signed all of the appropriate legal paperwork. The mother is indeed interested in using those eggs and a donor sperm to create embryos. And she'd like to carry an embryo and have one essentially granddaughter from her daughter to remember her and to fulfill her daughter's dying wish. What do you think? 
Is this something that's acceptable? Can an IVF clinic do this? Now that's a real life scenario and it comes up. It's come up a handful of times for me between the different places that I've worked. So my answer is assuming all of the legal fulfillments have been met and that that mom really does have ownership of those eggs, yes. Yes, she can do what she pleases with them. I would also say, you know, this is a very unique situation for me and I'd want to talk to the physician that that couple is working with. I'd want to talk to the ethical board, the medical ethical board at our institution to review the situation because it is so unique, but personally, I'm not opposed to it. If you wanted to go even further, you could say something like, wow, I've never thought of a situation like that. That is really unique and I could never put myself in the shoes of a parent who's lost a child to cancer and for that child's dying wish to be to create embryos and create babies from her frozen eggs. And I can't imagine being in that spot. And you can demonstrate your empathy. You can demonstrate openness, um, awareness to different people's situations. So I think a lot of times if you can tie in some of those competencies of genetic counselors, that's fantastic. Last scenario here. Okay, guys, let's say you work at a company that runs whole exome sequencing or a laboratory rather that runs whole exome sequencing on anyone who wants it, anyone who can pay for it. And let's say you've just done testing for a couple, um, a relatively healthy adult male and adult, adult female that are in their late 40s. And their results don't show anything concerning. There's no hereditary cancer genes. There's no hereditary cardiovascular genes. Um, there's a few little things that show a slight increased risk for coronary artery disease, a small increased risk for certain adverse reactions to specific drugs or medications. But they tell you after you complete their results session that the next thing they'd like to do is to have their 13-year-old daughter tested. What do you think about that? So what I would be saying, I think of this first part of the question is kind of one of those knowledge-based questions. I'd be wondering, does their daughter have any health concerns? Does she have any problems that makes them you know, want to do whole exome sequencing for her? If so, she should definitely be evaluated by her pediatrician and maybe referred to a specialist of some sort, perhaps depending on the situation, a geneticist, pediatric geneticist to evaluate what type of testing would be best for her in that scenario. Let's say I'm the interviewer now and I say, no, she's perfectly healthy. There's absolutely nothing wrong with her. She's had no health issues besides she was a little bit of a colicky infant, but she's doing great now. We just want, as parents, this information for her. We think it would be cool to know more about her genetics and for her to have access to that information. What would you say to the parents? Would you offer them the testing? Now, my answer as a genetic counselor would be no. I would not. I would say that there are lots of ethical considerations when you consider genetic testing on a minor, especially depending on how able that minor is to make informed decisions. One of the easy things to discuss is life insurance. Life insurance is not protected by GINA. That means that there is a potential risk that you could have discrimination based on your genetic testing results by life insurance and no 13 year olds purchase life insurance policies. So that's something perhaps these parents would see and say, oh, I don't want a specific genetic diagnosis tied to my daughter's name for that reason. The more important piece is autonomy. I would be thinking about autonomy of the daughter as a genetic counselor. Each person should be able to make the decision of whether they want genetic information for themselves or not. Now, of course, there's exceptions to this. When you have a sick kid and you're trying to figure out their diagnosis to help take care of them and help with their medical management, of course, you don't need that child's consent to do the testing. You rely on the parent's consent. But when you're testing a healthy child with a test as broad as whole exome sequencing where anything could come up, including dozens and dozens of adult onset conditions that that child may not want to know about, you are taking away that child's autonomy to make that decision for themselves of whether they want to know that or not and when they want to know that. So for me as a genetic counselor, I'd say, no, I'm not comfortable with 
a child at the age of 13 having whole exome sequencing for the main reason of autonomy and the chance that an adult onset condition could come up that she may not want to know about, um, as well as other issues like life insurance. Then what if the interviewer says, okay, well, that couple, they also have a 17-year-old daughter and she really wants the testing, the daughter herself, not the parents. What do you think of that? If a minor is approaching adulthood, approaching the age of 18, I think I would be comfortable seeing her for a pretest consult and evaluating her understanding of whole exome sequencing and explaining all of the different findings that could come back, exploring how those findings might make her feel and let her make a decision. I would probably encourage her to wait until she turned 18 to make that decision, but if she seems mature and her parents and her are both on board for the testing and she's already 17, I could potentially get behind helping her complete that testing. Okay, guys, so that's it. There's my three not quick ethical questions as examples uh, to help you hopefully prepare for your genetic counseling interviews. Let me know down below if you have feedback on my responses. Let me know if you have other ethical questions that you wonder how I would answer. And of course, let me know what else you're worried about for interviews because I'd love to make a video about it. Bye, guys.